and welcome to an incredibly important discussion about how we value treat our essential workers and more importantly how we structures to enable the sector of the economy to flourish in what is going to be hopefully a post-pandemic world one day soon. One thing we've all learned in the last 18 months, apart from the fact we've all had to grapple with the technology involved in virtual conferences, um, one thing we've all learned is that we ignore, downplay or deride central workers at our peril. We need to focus more on how to support them because quite apart from the moral issues and the health issues, there's potentially a very exciting economic issue as well. Does the world the forum has calculated that if we put increased investment in health and social care, we could be increasing global GDP by $380 billion by the year 2030. So we have today a terrific collection of CEOs involved in companies working in this space. We've got some labor, labor activists, and we've also got policymakers who are going to be telling us about what could or should be done. Um, in no particular order, on the CEO side, we have Tanya Koch, who's Chief Executive Officer from Tell Us You Care, Jeff Huber, who's Chief Executive Officer of Home Instead. We've got Guy Ryder, who's Director General of the International Labour Organization, Sally Rover, who's the International Coordinator for Women in Informal Employment, and Nicholas Schmidt, who's Commissioner for Jobs and Social Rights at the European Commission. So, Perhaps I can start with you, um, Commissioner Schmidt, and ask you, governments historically haven't spent a lot of time thinking about healthcare workers, people at the bottom of the pile and the employment side of things. Um, we learned in COVID that that it can be a terrible mistake. What exactly is the European Commission doing at the moment to try and put this centre stage in the agenda? And do you have any sort of informal numbers or calculations to give us an indication about the importance of this, both in terms of a human context and an economic context? Yes, uh, thank you very much. Uh, good morning and good evening. Uh, I think uh, uh, it's, it's really uh, very timely to discuss uh, this issue. And I noticed that uh, the uh, concept of essential worker, I never heard before uh, this idea of essential workers before the pandemic. So uh, the pandemic finally showed us what essential workers are and how uh, indispensable they are for the well-being of our societies and for the good functioning of our society. First, you asked me about what, uh, uh, what the uh, European Union has done since uh, on this idea of uh, essential workers' uh, long-term care. First, uh, I think the... Uh, this commission has created a new department, which is called uh, uh, the Department on Demography and which includes also the issue of aging society. We have uh, become aware uh, that societies in Europe, but not only in Europe, are aging very rapidly. And therefore that the, uh, the issue of long-term care has become a very important issue. And therefore this year, we, uh, we have prepared a report on long-term care, uh, showing how the evolution will be, uh, the numbers of people, essential workers we will need. Now, this sector in Europe employs about 6.4 million people. And uh, we have calculated that given the evolution of uh, the numbers of, uh, of uh, especially elderly people, but also the needs in the area of childcare, uh, the, the job creation potential is about 7 million jobs uh, by 2030. So this is very short term. And we all know also that uh, this sector is very much gendered because uh, uh, not only a majority uh, of uh, uh, people aged more than 65 are women who have to be taken care because women um, grew older than men, but also those who are working in the care sector are uh, uh, at almost 90% uh, women. 
So this is uh, uh, this is a very important uh, element also also in relation to uh, the labor market and uh, uh, when we uh, include the informal carers the informal carers and we know that informal care is of high importance uh, uh, in this in this uh, field uh, well uh, uh, an overall majority uh, are also uh, women now uh, just uh, a few ideas first uh, uh, what you have mentioned i think there there's a a very important human factor and that's why also we have discovered this idea of essential workers because uh, for a long time we, we considered that these jobs were more or less well second class jobs and this uh, has changed and it is extremely important that this change with us. So there's this societal perception uh, of these jobs and uh, uh, we have really to work on that and I thank you very much for organizing uh, this, uh, uh, this summit on this particular issue. issue. Uh, second, we, we have, and I've mentioned the informal carer, there's the, these invisible workers, mainly women, uh, who are doing the care work for their families, uh, especially uh, for the elderly uh, family members. And we estimate that alone this informal care, uh, care work has an economic value uh, between 2.4 to 2.7 percent of EU uh, GDP. So this is also an, an element we have absolutely uh, to take care uh, uh, into account. What, what could be the solution very briefly? Uh, improving uh, working conditions because uh, we, we, have short, we have already a sh major shortage in this sector, uh, a labor shortage. And uh, uh, in, in, in order to correct this labor shortage, we have to improve working conditions. And this means uh, uh, not only improving uh, salaries, wages, that's obviously uh, absolutely uh, indispensable to improve uh, uh, the wages, we have uh, to improve uh, social dialogue, we have to introduce more collective bargaining in this sector. We see that in some member states this functions, in others it is extremely absent. We have to invest in training because these are not uh, jobs which uh, do not require uh, very special skills. And I would say it's not only technical skills, obviously they are technical skills, but they are especially soft skills. Soft skills are key uh, in the care work and uh, you cannot be a good carer if you have not this kind of soft skills of empathy, uh, which uh, on one hand is important for, th for those people who are, you are take care of, but also for yourself. And therefore, we have to invest in, in their skills and upskill the, the, the care workers. And finally, certainly the digital technologies may a bit alleviate the job of the care workers. And this is uh, uh, when I look also at countries like Japan, they try in, to introduce uh, digital technologies, robots, but at the end, it's about uh, human contact. You cannot just uh, introduce robots, but robots or digital technologies can improve uh, working conditions. And my last point I would uh, 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 highlight is that uh, as there are labor shortages, especially in a, for an uh, aging society in Europe, well, there is a dimension of migration. There is a dimension of uh, free movement. Already today, uh, in, in uh, many European countries, uh, are working in the care sector are very often people moving from one part of Europe to another part, from the poorer part to the richer part. Uh, but this is not uh, absolutely sustainable. And on the other hand, migration is becomes indispensable if we want uh, uh, to fill these millions of jobs which will open and uh, uh, in this sector and will not uh, uh, be filled. Now, um, how do we uh, face these issues? Well, we have, as I've already mentioned, the long-term care report, but now we uh, are working on a new European care strategy because 
uh, this is a European issue, as it might be a Japanese and uh, also a U.S. Uh, issue, but it's obviously a European issue, and therefore we have to uh, uh, work on the best solutions uh, which uh, uh, allows Europe uh, uh, to face this and uh, to make out of this professions, out of care, a real uh, well-perceived, well-regarded, and well a remunerated uh, uh, profession. Thank you. Well, thank, thank you very much indeed, um, Commissioner Schmidt, um, for that very thoughtful overview. Um, so we've heard what the government direction is. Um, the good news is that there's a recognition that this is an issue which needs to be tackled and that essential workers are indeed essential and should be visible. Um, I would imagine the bad news is there's still quite a long way to go until the ideas that C Commissioner Schmidt has sketched out are put into practice. So let me bring in Guy and Sally to ask you, from your point of view, trying to champion workers, whether this is enough. Perhaps we can start with you, Guy. Representing the ILO, International Labour Organization, are you um, convinced by what you've heard from Commissioner Schmidt? As always, I'm convinced by, by the Commissioner, but I just perhaps want to uh, expand the conversation because if I'm getting the conversation right, we're sort of making uh, essential workers synonymous with health and care workers, and I think it goes beyond that. Uh, of course, of course, health and care workers are, are central to the conversation, but all of us who've lived through the, the, the pandemic uh, together know that I think there are other categories that we need to need to keep our eyes upon. I'm thinking of cleaning staff, I'm thinking of public transport workers, I'm thinking of retail workers, I'm thinking of uh, maritime uh, workers who have been declared essential workers by the UN General Assembly, food production distribution, it goes on and on. But I think the point here is uh, somehow this pandemic has been a wake-up call, drawing our attention to things that we knew or previously, that there are people in the in our workforces who are contributing enormously to the the well-being of us all and to our societies and whose work is undervalued. I mean, the fact that we're having a conversation about revaluing rather presupposes that something's gone wrong here <laughs> and we need to think about uh, how we put it right. And, and perhaps I can address that from a, you know, a labour market perspective. Well, I don't think there's any big secrets here. And uh, Nicola, has, uh, Nicola Schmidt has uh, referred to some of the things that we have to look at. Uh, we have to get uh, people's wages and conditions to where they uh, where they should be, uh, uh, commensurate with their contribution, the value of their work. Uh, there are labour shortages in all of these sectors or liable to be. People preferring to get out of these sectors if something else is available. And there we have the tools. The tools are available to us. When we talk about public sector workers, obviously government policy comes in, public uh, sector wage settlements, that always gets to be a bit of a, bit of a, a, a difficult situation. Minimum wages, um, uh, sectoral collective bargaining arrangements. These are the classic tools. And till now, we've chosen not to use them. We just it's, it's a matter of choice. Uh, and I think it's as simple as that. So if we're you know, sufficiently serious in believing that these people's work needs to be better valued than it previously and currently is, we have to pick these tools out of the toolbox and, and, and put them to work. And I think reverting to the care and health um, uh, uh, sectors, yet there is something bigger at play here. Uh, we've got to rethink the way our societies uh, provide health and care. The whole notion of a care economy and its professionalization, valuing the work which is currently unpaid, informal and invisible, these, I think, require a slightly broader and more innovative approach to the issues. So that would be my take on the on, on the discussion, Julian. Right. Um Perception, Sally. I mean, in terms of um, you know how, what you've seen develop, you know, during COVID, from the perspective of the women you represent, um, you know, what's happening with pay, what's happening with recognition and working conditions. Yeah, thanks, Gillian. I mean, I think the, the the place to begin, just to expand a bit more um, from what Guy said, is. In order for us to think about this question of essential work, we, we first need to take into account uh, context and to ask what the employment structure actually looks like in any geography in question, because the standard toolbox of policy measures 
may not be appropriate. So for example, what percentage of all workers are in informal employment in this geography, meaning that they have no social protection and no labor protection? What percentage of workers are in wage employment, employment as opposed to self-employment? In some places, the vast majority of workers are in uh, informal employment. And if we're looking particularly at women informal workers, the vast majority are actually self-employed. So a standard policy tool like uh, wage subsidies, for example, or minimum wages and so on, won't apply to most uh, most of those workers. So beginning to ask these questions about what the employment structure looks like, we can start to see and, and really open up some, some thinking about what tools will, will work where. Just to, to, to add a, a bit more on that point, if in developing countries, on average, 90% of total employment is informal employment. So if we're thinking about um, essential work, actually, we need to reverse the concept and recognize that work itself is essential to everyone, regardless of what sector there is, they're in. So there's nothing to fall back on except for work. To work today means to eat today. Um, and then we need to think about, you know, what at this moment, particularly, and, and looking at the mounting evidence that workers who were already vulnerable before COVID-19 because of labor force status, place of work, migrant status, and so on, which who have faced the greatest risks and largest impacts. Um, and, and think about the question of essential work depending on from who, whose view is, is being solicited. So these are questions that I think we, we need to keep in mind again as we think about the right mix of policy measures and actually ask ourselves what is the mis mix that will do the most to reduce risk and vulnerability across the broadest section possible of the employment structure and then really, really distinguish the different pathways between, for example, wage employed workers and self employed workers, recognizing that actually some needs are all the same, but some needs are different. So they all need social protection. Uh, we have 4.1 billion people on the planet who have no in income security at all from their national social protection systems. But of course, the impact of those uh, of these issues play themselves out differently across different categories of work. Right. I should say, by the way, that if anyone watch it, watching wants to ask a question, do send it in and we'll deal with that via Slido and we'll have some Q&A towards the end. Um, now, I'm going to turn in just a second to Jeff and Tanya to ask, you know, what are the business models that can lead to better job quality and pay? Before I do, I mean, just Sally and Guy, are there two or three things specifically you'd like to ask policymakers to do? I mean, do you have a shopping list of your top one or two quick bullet points of what needs to happen? Guy? Well, well, I, I do think um, that this, this whole notion of a, a strategy for the future of the care economy, the professionalization, the um, improving the quality of care work needs to be addressed, I think, in, in, the, national, in the national context. We're, we're, we're facing, because of the dynamics of demography and much else, an extraordinary deficit in that regard. We know that um, we're talking about the deficit in uh, health workers of 18 million by 2030 as well. So I, I think we need the bigger discussion. It's got to be at the level of governments in Europe, at the level of the, of the European Union. So that would be perhaps my, my biggest take in that regard. Right. And what about you, Sally? I would say the top two things on our shopping list would be, first of all, uh, universal social protection that includes a mix of social assistance, inclusive social insurance, and social services, such as healthcare and childcare, um, to, um, to reach all workers and, and all households. And, and the second thing is to recognize um, that there are these distinct pathways to recovery because there are distinct pathways of impact of the pandemic itself. And so, and I think on that one, we would really love to see national governments working directly with local governments because local governments have a disproportionate impact on so many workers in the informal economy. If you think of, um, for example, in South Africa, 
uh, street traders selling food were designated as such a work group because the low income population sources most of their food, or, or in some cases all of their food, from informal street vendors. And so finding ways for national and local governments to work together on this uh, to create a more, a more um, supportive environment is, is high on our list as well. Right, thank you. Um, okay, so we've had a look at the policymakers. What about business? Tanya, tell us what exactly Tell Us Your Care does and how you think you can or cannot create a new business model to try and support some of these, um, you know, calls for action. Thank you, Jillian. Um, so Tell Us is a hardware and software company um, that uses um, technology to help with remote care and we specifically sell to facilities. And I can speak to how businesses can use technology to improve job quality for caregivers in the field. Um, in general, my view is that the role of technology can be used to um, automate these really difficult tasks for caregivers. So an example is nighttime care in a facility, a shift that's typically really understaffed. Um, in Japan, uh, caregivers will check the elders every two hours, and it's really difficult because you're on your feet. It's not efficient because you can miss a lot by just doing these spot checks. But with technology, if you know the status of someone in a room, whether they are asleep or awake or otherwise, you as a caregiver can be on call to focus on the situations that matter. And as a caregiver, you get to do the really valuable work where you really need the personal and human interaction that judgment and experience and ability to escalate. So in one facility we work with, for example, we do just this because we notify um, caregivers of their resident status. In one particular uh, case, for example, our technology alerted that a resident with dementia had left a room, which was unusual for her, and they immediately found her falling asleep over the sink they took her back to bed and, and ultimately prevented a fall from happening. And you can see how this could easily be missed if they were only checking rooms, rooms in, a, in a spot like check. So um, that's just one example of how technology can be used. I've also seen other types of care robots really successfully used um, you know, for lifting residents, something that's really physically demanding, um, especially um, you know, for care workers uh, lifting into to wheelchairs, for example. So there are many examples. And I think Japan, as some others have noted, is an example of, a, of um, really a success in terms of government encouraging the use of technology. Well, having lived in Japan for a while myself, I can say that Japan is one of the few countries yeah. in the industrialized world where people love their robots and AI platforms. Yes. Might be Partly due to Astro Boy, um, for those of you who've lived in Japan and have long memories, it's probably also because they are running out of workers and there's nothing like necessity being not just a source of invention, but a reason to embrace invention and disruption. But um, Jeff, um, what about you? What is Home Instead? What are you doing and how does this play into your work? Yeah, thank you, Jillian. It's great to be a part of such a great conversation. Home Instead is a global provider of in-home care for older adults. So we send a professional trained caregiver uh, into our client's home. Typically, that is the traditional family home, but it can be in a residential facility of some sort as well, and provide essential services such as uh, social interaction, stimulation, uh, making sure they're uh, having meals, making sure they're taking their medications, noticing and escalating uh, critical changes uh, preemptively uh, in, in the client's condition. Um, so we're able to, um, through a relationship focus, um, really provide uh, a better quality of life for our clients, uh, lower overall uh, healthcare costs. Uh, so we know that when we are part of the uh, equation, our clients are gonna have a higher quality of life, enjoy better outcomes, access the traditional healthcare system uh, far less, uh, and allow them to remain exactly where they want to be, which is in the safety and security of their own home. If the pandemic taught us anything at all, it taught us that the home is the safest place uh, to care for our global aging society. And so as we think about the future, we're about the largest demographic shift in the history of the world. 500 million baby boomers are about to enter the highest healthcare usage years of their lives. 
We know that the home is the only scalable place to care for them. I like to say that the, the hospital of the future looks a lot like your living room. So I think it's essential that we quickly scale up a workforce that can meet that incredible demand so that we can provide higher quality care to our aging society, better outcomes, higher quality of life, allow people uh, to age exactly where they want. So the bottom line is, I think we all have to come together. I think the folks on on this uh, call can are the right group to start this conversation. We've created also a report called Building uh, the Caregiver Workforce that our global aging society needs. Uh, we're about to have a workshop in collaboration with the OECD uh, to really elevate the conversation about this. Uh, I agree with Commissioner Schmidt. The first and probably most important thing we need to do is to change the perception of these jobs from jobs of last resort to being the valued and professional vocations that they truly are and recognize the value that they bring to society. Um, so that's the, the first and most important thing that needs to happen. We also need to create training standards, elevate training, um, and, and really help to onboard uh, mass numbers of people that, that really see this as a growth uh, economy uh, in the labor market. Thank you. Well, I'm curious, I mean, from your accent, and you can't always tell, you know, I have an English accent, I'm actually sitting in New York. From your accent, though, you are American. We've heard from Commissioner Schmidt a view of what the European Commission wants to do. Um, right now, of course, in Washington, we have a contentious bill being proposed to Congress, which picks up on some of these themes, which may or may not actually see the light today in practical terms. So I'm curious, um, to what degree do you think that you're gonna get any support from the American government, um, or is this just gonna be an area where the Europeans talk about it, where the Japanese learn to love their robots, but nothing actually happens in America? Well, I think it's going to take a multi-stakeholder approach. It, we, we can't uh, approach this with just government solution in mind. So here in the United States, you know, we have 80 million baby boomers about to enter their 80s prime caregiving need years, the highest healthcare usage years of their lives. We're also nearly $30 trillion in debt. And so there's just a reality that we're going to need multiple solutions. We're going to need... Um, uh, you know, technology solutions that help to uh, increase capacity, just like Tanya talked about. We're going to need to create new funding resources because there's a reality that um, the government simply isn't going to be able to pay for this. We're going to need uh, a new uh, whole structure to create a whole new job market in the in this care economy uh, and give people the ability to help fund their own care. Um, so it, it's going to take a multi-stakeholder approach. I think if we, wait, if we wait for Congress to do something, we're going to be waiting a very long time. This is an area where I think the private sector can lead and help to shape the policy needs of the future. Right, right. Well, that's certainly one of the roles of forums like the World Economic Forum, trying to bring these different stakeholders together and get the conversation going both across the Atlantic and between different parts of, you know, public, private, and FDA world. But we've got a great question that's come in, which is this. With widespread labor shortages across essential jobs, is now the time that care providers, retailers, et cetera, will be nudged into finally starting to pay their workers fairly? Are we going to see wages going up? And to my mind, that's a very interesting issue because, you know, I mean, even Amazon, which used to be regarded as, you know, someone that was not in a hurry to pay people, is now paying, you know, warehouse workers fifteen, eighteen dollars. Talking to CEOs in America, that's having a real knock-on effect across the board. So I'm curious, any of you want to jump in? Perhaps I should start with Guy as to whether you think now is it for the ILO to start campaigning for wage rises for your workers? That, that's not the sort of campaign we engage in, but I think the answer to your question is yes. I mean, it's a long while since I studied economics, but when you have a a shortage in the supply of labor normally the result is in a free market the wages go up uh, and it's interesting uh, to, to speculate why that does not that adjustment uh, it doesn't seem to be filtering through as yet maybe you could argue uh, it's uh, it's early days yet but you know what are the mechanisms through which wages go up okay the, the you know the, the back and forth of uh, demand and supply it is about minimum wage uh, in many countries i mean health staff care staff generally 
are at the bottom rung. They're on the minimum wage. Uh, so that matters a great deal. So there's a discussion to be had, particularly in the United States, around minimum wage. There's also been quite a long history, uh, and I think of the United States, an example uh, of organizing in the, uh, in the, in, in the care industry. Uh, the service employees industry, SEIU, has been extremely active, and there's been some, some quite difficult uh, stories to be told about that. So, as I said, we know the tools. We know what, 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 uh, uh, you know, how, how markets should react and how labor markets should react. Uh, and I would say that, you know, to those who say, and I agree with it, that, you know, the key here is improving the perception of work uh, in the care and health uh, sectors. You know, the perception will go with the reality. The perception will go with the reality of working in the sector. And that goes straight back to, to wages, career development, etc., uh, etc. Cetera, et cetera. With everything, of course, uh, that technology can do to help, no doubt about it. Everything we can do to provide the, the best, very best quality care to those who need it. Uh, being, you know, guiding poles for these things. But the perception will adjust to the reality. And I, I think it's illusory to think uh, anything else. I see, Jeff, you're nodding. nodding. Do you expect wages to go up? Yeah. Also, you know, we're, say yes, absolutely. But um... <laughs> uh, we're already experiencing, you know, dramatic upward pressure on, on wages right now. I think um, the market conditions are such that there's a real war for talent. And so that's creating upward pressure. Uh, and so absolutely we need, you know, a well-trained, um, well-respected, well-compensated, um, professional uh, home care sector. Part of the equation is not just the wage itself, very important. We have to take care of that, but we also have to look at their entire um, uh, work experience. And so we've recently uh, I've been merged with a company called Honor Technology, which is really focused uh, on providing solutions that create a better overall job experience for uh, our caregivers, our professional caregivers, care professionals, so that then they go and create better um, uh, experiences for their clients. So it's, it's about making sure that uh, they are paid when they are paid uh, timely, what they're expected to be paid, but they're also able to have greater autonomy and agency over their own schedule. Because in the home care sector, you can get paired up with a client. That client goes away for one reason or another. That creates tremendous job insecurity. So uh, having technology that allows them to then immediately have uh, new clients, new jobs, better matches for their skills and their personalities, uh, more consistent hours. We have to look at the whole uh, experience uh, of, the, of the care worker, uh, not just look at wage in isolation. It is the in, entire uh, proposition of their employment. Right. Well, I'm going to come back to Commissioner Schmidt in just a moment. Before I do, though, I'd like to ask um, Sally and Tanya a question, another question we've got, which is that across, this is a question, Across economies, there's a growing mismatch between labor supply and demand. How can we accelerate job transitions into future care jobs? I'm sure part of that must be about technology and training, but any thoughts on that, Sally or Tanya? And then I want to turn to Commissioner Schmidt. I can quickly jump in. Um, so this comes up a lot in uh, working in Japan, which is uh, facing a major caregiver shortage, and they are looking for, for caregivers from abroad. And um, in this case, technology can really help. And we've talked with facilities about this a lot um, because it helps with communication between foreign care workers and, uh, you know, care workers who um, are already in the facility. And um, I think that's really important that, you know, having objective data, having Technology can really ease those that communication, and really um, the facilities can deliver better care. So that's that's one thought I have. Um, yeah. Right. Thank you, Sally. Yeah, just to add, I think um, one place to look for answers uh, is the representative organizations of workers in these sectors. So, for example. Uh, the International Domestic Workers Federation brings together unions of domestic workers from uh, more than 60 countries. And so they are in touch with care workers, domestic workers in all of the geographies where they have affiliates and they can 
you know, put, put their finger on what the needs are, what suppose, let's suppose, you know, skills training, re-entry, um, what have you, those representative organizations uh, are the ones who really have the answers to these questions. And there are now, a, there's now a global network of uh, street vendor organizations. There's a global network of home-based workers who are both self-employed and then work uh, subcontractors in global supply chain. So that's the place to go for, uh, for the answer to the question of, of how to do it, I think. Right. Well, thank you. Commissioner Schmidt, what are your thoughts? I mean, do you want to have a minimum wage across the European Union for care work? Do you want to enforce a ban on zero hour contracts? I know that's primarily an American concept, but it does exist in part of Europe. Um, do you want to have mandatory training schemes? I mean, what's your thoughts on this one? And you have about two minutes to tell us. Okay, <laughs> that's uh, well, I, I just want to say we, we pay very, very well. People would take care of our money and we do not consider the, the work of those who take care of people, of our families, of our parents, of our children. And this is a paradox in our society. And I think we have to uh, rebalance this a bit and change a bit the hierarchy in the wages and salaries and in uh, not only of perception, but also in real terms. Now, I think uh, working conditions are essential uh, in that uh, sense. Uh, minimum wages have been mentioned. Certainly, they are important. In Europe, uh, we are working on a framework for minimum wages, especially for those countries where minimum wages are very low. And by the way, a lot of people leave these countries to go in and uh, to other parts in Europe and uh, especially also to work in these uh, care sectors. But we consider that uh, uh, we, we have to increase uh, uh, or at least reduce the gaps uh, in terms of minimum wages and uh, especially also uh, in terms of uh, gender equality because uh, uh, we have a lot uh, discussed the issue of um, uh, informal workers and a lot of inform the majority of informal workers, domestic workers are women. So there is an issue of uh, gender pay gap. Uh, the commission now has made proposals on job uh, on uh, wage transparency. We have to reduce. We have to. Uh, uh, suppress this uh, uh, pay gap. So there are a lot of issues which come together we have to, uh, to deal with in order to, uh, uh, to, uh, to change uh, the situation and make these jobs uh, attractive. A last word, I, I agree on technology. I think this is very important, but technology will not replace the human side. And second, we have to develop home care I think this is a very important issue in our societies. And the third is the financial issue. Yes, our, our protection, uh, social protection has to be adapted uh, to people aging, to age, an aging society. And therefore, some countries have introduced a care insurance. So in order to finance uh, old age and the care you need, uh, and, uh, and this would also allow better wages, better financing, better institutions. And this is uh, uh, what we are dealing with when we talk about uh, a European care strategy. We include all these aspects uh, in, this, uh, in this strategy. Thank you. Well, thank you very much indeed. That's a very, very comprehensive shopping list. Um, let's hope you get at least some of it through. And in the meantime, it just remains for me to say a very big thank you to all of our panelists. I have to sum up, you know, the conversation with one sort of phrase or image. It's really this. Um, before I became a journalist, I trained as a cultural anthropologist. And anthropology is dedicated to making the unseen seen, to look at the part that we so often ignore, what we call um, social silences, the sight the works of Pierre Bourdieu, a wonderful French intellectual. And COVID-19 really has confronted us with all manner of social silences. The often terrible state of care workers, um, essential workers, um, has been one of the silences that has been exposed. And let's hope that we don't forget the lesson too quickly as COVID hopefully begins to recede and actually do try to address this to build back better in every sense.
So thank you all very much indeed. And best of luck to you in pushing forward with these very important initiatives.